I'm so excited to bring you uh, this really special guest today. He's actually a very close friend of mine. Uh, you probably have seen him on the small screen. It's WNBC weather anchor Dave Price. And Dave, I'm just so excited to have you join us today because I know a lot about you, but I think others would be interested in hearing more about your story. Well, I'm, I'm, first of all, I'm glad to be here and, I, and I'll let everyone in on the secret. I've known you, I think, for, for 20 years since you were in vitro and I had more hair and it was a different color. So anything for you and, and it's great to be here. Right. Since I could take my first drink legally, right? Right, right. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much. And I just, I love so much about you and I, I really think that, you know, a lot of people know you as the WNBC weather anchor. Take a look, watches and warnings continue. What I find most interesting, it's one of the first things you told me when we met, was that you actually worked for Taco Bell and Pepsi, and you were not broadcasting for them. You graduated Cornell, as did I, although we didn't know each other there. No. You actually uh, worked as a human resources executive, and... Um, it's just amazing. It seems like one day you just decided to say, okay, I'm gonna wake up and try something new. How, how did this all happen? I went to Cornell. I went to Cornell to pursue a degree in industrial and labor relations. I had wanted to be- Not an a, easy a school, weather. by the way. Right? No, I, no I, not right. an easy school, great <laughs> school. And and I should add, uh, you know, a, a fascinating course of study, which I wound up practicing as a professional for. 10 years, but I always wanted to be a weatherman from the time I was a kid. And kind of, you know, as, as a lot of people are in life, um, detoured. But I was a human resources manager and uh, uh, for, for PepsiCo for the better part of a decade before I ever found my way into to TV. It's amazing. What was the moment when you said, okay, today's the day that I'm just going to make this significant career change. You know, I'm earning a good living. I'm well-schooled in this field. And, you know, what, what clicked in your brain to tell you that that was the time to make that change? I had just uh, kind of spearheaded a big corporate meeting and, and someone in the audience came up to me and said, you know, you're, you're kind of a big personality to be in <laughs> HR. You know, you remind me of my brother. My brother's a uh, uh, an anchor man in uh, in a small town in Pennsylvania. You you remind me more of a TV personality. Hmm. And Dane and I said, "My God, I would love to meet your brother and hear all about what he does." And and I've always wanted to be a, a television weatherman. Um, so I I just love to pick his brain. And that was the beginning. I can trace it back to that meeting, <laughs> that interaction, and uh, that set forth a chain of events that that uh, got me in the field. So you started out in Erie, Pennsylvania, and you made your way. You've been on Fox 5. I think that's where you were when I first met you. I think we were doing some other segments together other than the weather, some right. ice cream segments. We watched you on the CBS Early Show. We've seen you in the streets of New York City, interviewing people on the street, and now at WNBC. Hey, everybody, it's Dave Price. You know, I'm a weatherman. And so you've been in, in various, at various networks. And I'm curious, like, what is your favorite part about doing the weather? Is it being on television? Is it imparting information that people really need? We are expecting Ida's remnants to make their way into our area. What is it that you enjoy the most about what you do? How long do we have? I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, to be honest with you, the answer is so complicated that that there's not a sound bite I can give you. But mm -hmm. can you try? let me, like, yeah, let me kind of uh, unpeel the onion. I love the chemistry that exists between where I am in the studio or wherever I'm broadcasting and the people who are watching. I love the relationship that I have with all across the tri-state area and around the country when I was on network television. I love that. I, I love the idea that I've made friends and relationships with people that I don't even know physically. 
That's, so the that's, celebrity, for better words, can we call it the celebrity no, aspect? No. No, no, no. Right, celebrity you're not is actually very, interacting with them while you're doing it. Right, but celebrity is something different. I mean, celebrity is, you know, celebrity is Michael Jordan. Um, you know, celebrity is... A lot Jennifer of people Aniston. would say you're a celebrity, Dave. No, no, but this is more about... So. <laughs> I don't. This isn't about recognition. It's about the bond that exists between me and the people who I'm grateful watch. And I love walking down the street and having someone say, you started my day off with a smile this morning, or thanks for the information you gave me. <laughs> that gives me such intrinsic happiness. Straight line winds roar straight through. The idea that I'm here giving people information they need, I love that. That's a role I cherish. That's a responsibility I recognize and appreciate. And I take great pride in, in that. And finally, I don't know how else to describe it. When the red light goes on, it is, it, it is genuinely joyful. Walk on over to the weather wall together. Remember, uh, we were just a few moments ago talking about the fact, whatever happened to the white Christmas? And I don't know what that is or why psychologically that is. Dave, show us the five-day forecast. In fact, let's take a look at the five-day forecast right now, and you can see, look at these temperatures. And you've been known to dance, I, too, when that light goes I've been known. I've been known to dance. <laughs> I've been right. known to sing. Here we go. Come on. Sir. I can't describe what it feels like, and I can't even dissect why it brings me such happiness but that light that camera the studio it's the happiest office i've ever ever <laughs> ever had that's an amazing feeling i don't know that most of us feel that way i know that right having had a job which i certainly liked versus a job which i absolutely love there's a big 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 difference and it's it's the best so if someone said, you know, I'm at a job that I really don't love and I don't like waking up to do this anymore, what advice would you give them? Would, would you say, you know, just chase your dream? I would say establish a strategy. Think about how you can do it. Begin to network. Begin to explore to make sure your dreams are all that they appear to be. A life without passion, a career without passion is a challenging thing to get through. Luck plays a role too, right? I mean, you, you need to work hard at something, but um, you also, um, my grandfather used to say, it's like a combination of hard work, marrying with luck, um, you know, that, that you, you do need a little bit of that as well. Yeah. And if I didn't do this and I couldn't be in the market where I am and, and enjoy the good fortune and luck that I have, maybe I'd think? be announcing high school football games because it gave me <laughs> oh. that time in front of the microphone right. and and gave me a piece of that passion I have for broadcast. All kidding aside. I get it. I, I was find... gonna I thought you were gonna say the comedy place on on Second Avenue that maybe I would have seen you there doing live stand up. Right. That may uh, quite possibly so. It's no secret how I went from heavy to healthy. No fancy diets, no surgery. Just as unbelievable of a career change um you had a, a health change as well in, in a very favorable way how did you lose a hundred pounds i mean that's no small task it was closer to to, to 90 to be specific i re-educated myself on the importance of being healthy the risks of being unhealthy and what healthy eating is at least <laughs> You know, you, you know, you're a nutritionist. We have lost track in the United States what a portion is. We have lost track in this world we live in of, for many of us, of abundance, what it means to eat a balanced meal. I would have what most couples split for dinner. I'd begin the morning with eggs on a, a roll with cheese and a muffin. Now, a <laughs> muffin, a muffin. Oh, that sounds like a very petite word. A muffin can often contain 700 calories. Isn't that Let's not even begin to talk about sugar and all the other, mm -hmm. you know, uh, breakdowns of that. You would have that on Seven... top of the egg sandwich. I just want to be clear. Yes. Yes. Okay. As That's one breakfast. breakfast. Two pounds of macaroni and cheese. I had an issue with portion control. I had an issue with 
eating healthy food. I had an issue of a sedentary lifestyle. So I'd have a huge, huge lunch, uh, you know, pizza, macaroni and cheese uh, loaded with carbs. Mm. Um, dinner, I thought, well, sushi's healthy, but I'd have four rolls, you know, spicy mayonnaise, you know. Uh, a lot of people have tempura. a spicy mayo roll, but it's so it was the amount. It's the volume and it's on top of everything else. And then what would I do? I was so tired. I just laid down. Mm. I wasn't active at all. And, you know, finally, it was a combination of things. I didn't lose weight to look better. Let me <laughs> put the caveat on uh -huh. solely to look better. Right. The real driver was feeling better. Mm. I felt awful to wake up tired. Mm tired to to be exhausted midday to be grumpy and angry to not feel good is a painful existence and did that lead to more like emotional eating because you were what did it sure become it did. this like vicious cycle of you know not sure feeling it good about it's, it's not a vicious cycle it's a vicious spiral hmm. so um, you had, ga had you gained the 90 pounds yeah. From that period yeah. of time in your I, life? I, I, listen, you weren't were overweight as a child. I was chubby as a child. I grew up in a home where, you know, the motto was good to the last drop. <laughs> so if there's food on the plate, good to the last drop, eat it. Right. If there's dessert, a drink, you know, I was one of four children. So food got dropped in the middle of the table and you <laughs> took everything you could or it was gone. It's meant out of love. Mm. But in practice, it sets you up for for this idea of feast or famine. And I, I was going to say, like, it's so deep rooted, right? It's like you carry that upbringing, that completely forever. Up, right. And so sure. when faced with a, a pizza pie with eight slices, you might even eat more than you really need based out of that concept of, oh, I, you know, out of fear that maybe they won't be enough or. Um, right. Like it, it's it's, it's, it's a strange sense that this could be the last pizza. Right. That there are no more, that you'll never get to have pizza again because they're going to su suddenly close up all the pizza shops. I mean, it's it's yeah. it sounds crazy and it's not quite the way you think, but it's close. Yeah, it's you very know? I get it. So what what would you eat on a healthier day and how were you able to behaviorally make that shift? I enrolled in the uh, uh, weight loss management program at the University of California at Irvine. It's a battle. It is a battle and most people do gain all their weight back when they lose right. significant amounts of weight and more. Each and every day, it is to this day, as you well know, uh, being one of my closest friends, it's a struggle for me. Yeah. It's a right. struggle yeah. for me I to not fall back on old yeah. behaviors. No, I, and I and know, think, I know you're aware of every bite and, but, but I think it's and, what you kind of need to be doing on some level without being an unhealthy preoccupation. What I've seen and learned is that um, exercise plays its most significant role during weight maintenance. And you are very committed to that. And I give you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Listen, you're, you're, thank you for the applause. That was overwhelming. You don't have an expensive trainer, you know, a one on one. No, I don't have a trainer. Gym. Yeah, can you I don't have a trainer. Do? I don't have a gym. I don't take taxis or cabs or subways or buses anywhere unless I truly need to from a time standpoint. I just don't. I walk almost everywhere. You are right. I walk about 10 miles a day naturally. I don't do it just to burn calories. It settles my mind, keeps me and gets me outdoors. It builds muscle in a non-stressful way, you know, without the pounding that you get from running. Here's the thing. Mm -hmm. We can't strive for perfection and, yeah. uh, or become obsessed with it. Right. We, we have to effort towards the best we can do. If you make progress, measurable progress on that spectrum, you will be healthier. And, mm -hmm. I, and I am. Let's take a moment. You've kept off 90 pounds for almost 30 years. I think I lost initially like 65 or 70 uh -huh. and then you know, the additional 15 at, at times, you know, during that first five years and, and then kept it off. What I learned is the magic of how you can prepare vegetables and make them taste delicious. The simplest of ingredients will do to make food taste good. Mm. Salt, 
pepper, and virgin olive oil and roast something. And it's, in, it's incredible. It's Carrots so and broccoli and cauliflower. And I watch some of the stuff you make. I mean, it's, it's <laughs> like delicious stuff. Right. And we're um, not chefs. I, no, we're not. I probably follow a more Mediterranean diet, but don't get hooked on the terms. I eat a lot of fish. Right. Um, I still love pasta and rice. I do. Right. But I try and, you know, manage it. But I fight it. I fight it every day. And as you well know, I love ice cream. Right. I love Who ice cream. Who <laughs> doesn't? Who so, listening right but, now can honestly say that they don't like ice cream. Right. So what do I do? I, I have ice cream. Yeah. I, I don't go out and have a banana split, but I have <laughs> ice cream. I recognize that denying myself everything makes no sense. It just, it just doesn't. And by so, the way, there are times I gain five pounds. There are times I lose five pounds. Right. You just always got to yeah. watch. And, that, and, that's and one recognize. thing I know about you. You're always conscious of where you're at with yourself, whether it's five pounds up or five pounds down or. Right. And ever, yeah, and and you know, we do want to mention like we don't want to get to the point where it's a total unhealthy preoccupation. And if that's the case, it's probably best to speak with a counselor and you know someone. Cor who Correct. You want to be healthy in every sense of the word. I am uh, one of Steve's younger brothers. The only person who's known Steve longer than I have is our mother. I'm painfully aware that you recently lost your very beloved brother, Steve. He was pretty educated and, and, and knew what to do. You know, I know there are times he asked me about diet advice and sadly he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Dave Price emceed the Let's Win Together virtual gala where he honored his brother, Steve, who's been fighting pancreatic cancer. But he braved a four year battle, which really is so incredible. What life lessons has his fight with his illness taught you and do you have anything um that you might want to share with others who might be going through something similar um and if you don't want to answer that's no fine. no the um Battling serious illness, and in this case, you know, it was cancer, is really isolating and singular. What Steve taught me, the, the list is endless. Sharing and, um, and caring are restorative. I would watch him as we sat in the, the chemo suites or in a doctor's office, and he would look to see if there were new people hmm. who were there as ill as he was he would walk up to people and say my name's steve price and you know i've been here a while hmm. you know you know if there's anything you need you tell me how i can help you and i would sit there and watch him spread love his strength was herculean he taught me the the value of selflessness the level of strength you can gather in the darkest times. I'm going to be processing everything he taught me for the rest of my life. You know, I don't want to get personal on your own podcast. I mean, but you lost your mother this year as well. And right. it's hard to even express. We're still in that moment where the unbelievability of what happened is simply hard to process. I will never forget when my mother was diagnosed, you know, out of the blue with advanced colon cancer that had already metastasized to her liver. I remember you said, you know, Steve is happy to talk to her. I said, what? Right. <laughs> Steve, Steve is battling pancreatic cancer. Steve has enough on his plate to deal with. You're kidding, right? Like I, I and yet there Steve was during his illness that he was fighting so bravely and he really wanted to be of help to to my mother and, and he would be the first to say it made him feel better yeah steve had always been a community builder mm -hmm. you know linking people with people yes and as that i told essence. you 
Right. That was his essence. Yeah. And as I told you that as isolating as this is, he insisted on joining hands with others and having his hands outstretched to hold on to, to people who needed it. And he never, ever to his last breath gave up a sense of hope. I admire Steve so much, first and foremost, because he is a sexy beast, but also because he is my hero. I only hope I can play a part in, in carrying that legacy forward, my brothers and I. He'd want to know that you are carrying that out. It meant so much to him. And I feel like one thing he made so clear was how he cared to make a better future. We know that like he would be smiling oh, to think that his yes. illness was not for naught, that yes. somehow, some way through the efforts that you've made through pancreatic cancer research and treatments, that that's ultimately gonna help someone. And sadly, it couldn't yes. save him, but if it could help someone else, I think he made that yes. so clear. As some people throw around this term, well, the silver lining is. <laughs> There's no silver lining. No. <laughs> okay. There's no silver lining to cancer. No. no. None. So we put that aside. But we do learn from how people handle themselves mm -hmm. and how people treat others mm -hmm. through this disease, how families come together how matriarchs or patriarchs or brothers or sisters show their love to one another through this disease and what they leave behind. My favorite thing that you've told me about Steve is like someone else with one of his friends was diagnosed um, with pancreatic cancer. And I will, ne I will never forget that night. Yeah. You know, Steve's, Steve's friend, an old, old friend from high school had, had been diagnosed and, and Steve had, been in touch with her and was sharing what he knew and she had called and steve was in you know very significant pain at that point mm -hmm. and he said to me you know you know i've all i've got to call mary and i'm like steve i said you just like tomorrow the next day and he said no as you said he said now I call it tonight because that's what gives the day meaning. And in the end, we should live life finding moments every day mm -hmm. that give that day meaning. Mm -hmm. My brother left record of, of a life well lived, not because of degrees or jobs or Any success. <laughs> right, right. Or, or, material possessions, but because of the intangibles, mm -hmm. um, the love he spread, um, the knowledge he shared, mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the memories he left behind. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that will uh, sustain us. I don't know when it will be, but we will find a cure. Mm -hmm. And when we do, someone will remember Steve. Mm -hmm. I see him smiling, Dave. I, I do. I, listen. I could hear his voice. You know, say, <laughs> I, I'm on the other end of the of the interview here, or I, you know, I talk about your mom. We're both fortunate to have lived within the wingspan of incredibly beautiful people who made forever impacts on our lives. So strong that, that even though they're gone, we've got them mm -hmm. forever. Yeah. yeah, I know. I I sometimes feel like, oh, people think I don't have a mother. I don't think I don't have a mother. Right. Says who? Right. You no, know, it's like they live right. on. They really do become a part of you. And by the way, your brother was so proud of you. I think he'd be so honored to know that he's fully implanted in you now because I, I see it and I see it through all your yeah. efforts that you're doing on his behalf and in his honor and memory and and um you know I see him smiling at you well I uh I hope so you know we're 
<laughs> there were four boys. And and in 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 our world there still are. Right. And we'll why should there be. not be? Right. So ah, L D. Uh, He's as remarkable as he has always been, and if it can be, even in higher doses. Onward, ho, we fight on. Yeah. Dave Price, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All right, love you, LD. <laughs> love you too. <laughs>